Welcome everybody to Getting APIs to Work. Today we say again, hello to James Higginbotham. Hey James, how are you doing? Hey Eric, great, thanks for having me back. Thanks for being back. The last time you were here, we talked about your new book, The Principles of Web API Design. And we learned a lot about what you talk about in the book. And one of the things that you talk about is this ADDR process for designing web APIs. And I thought that's really interesting. And we hear a lot about how to design better APIs or maybe how to better design APIs. I don't even know how to put it. So I thought, let's just talk about this. So let's jump into it and talk about maybe a little bit about the origin of ADDR, and then we go through the process itself. Yeah. Uh, so the origin of ADDR was was interesting. I've been uh, developing and delivering workshops for organizations around the world for several years now. And in the process, it was uh, meant to coach people on how to design APIs. And that first iteration I focused a lot on you know, how do we figure out the activities and steps involved with an API and turn it into a web API design? But the more feedback I received from the workshops as well as from my consulting engagements, I started to realize there was a, a big gap on how to go from requirements to a web API design. People didn't quite understand how to make that transition. Uh, and, and then also those that are developers like, like ourselves and others that have written code before probably just sit, they, they kind of visualize the API design in their head and start writing code, but it may or may not actually map what's really needed, you know? And so we may end up having to change a lot of code as we discover more. And so we kind of go back into the design accidentally sometimes or accidentally on purpose maybe is a better way to think about it. So I wanted to come up with an approach that was easily scalable, repeatable, and teachable to help teams of all sizes understand how to approach an API design. And that's what this evolved into. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like about the process is that it's it's simple, it's easy to understand, and also it's clearly associated with roles. You know, who does what? And I think that is one of the things that we see becomes more and more important, where in the end, like you said, there, there are, of course, tech people involved, but ideally not only tech people. And I think that is where ADDR can help us. Absolutely. Let's jump right into it and, and let's start with like a brief visualization. So you have these phases and then you also have some steps that go with these phases. Let's just briefly look at how these phases relate to those steps that you also have. Yeah. So, so the, the process is called ADDR and it stands for align, define, design, and refine. Those are the four phases that we go through whenever we're trying to understand how to approach a particular API, the design of it, the ownership of it, uh, the collaborative nature of coming up with it and then taking it all the way from requirements to delivery. And within those four phases, what I do is I break down uh, seven steps across those four phases. And they just, as you transition from phase to phase, you can use different steps to go, um, you know, to help you through the process. So the first phase is align, and that's where we want to just make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, aligned together. The stakeholders, the any customers or partners that are going to be using the API, we want to do those kind of more product ownership interviews, and we want to work our way through that so that we make sure that we know we're building the right thing before we start to build it right using our engineering practices and principles. Uh, Thanks for using that that phrase that you know built the right thing and then built it right. Like that's I use yeah. that all the time. Also, I think yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's really important. It, yeah, and and as software developers, I think we we tend to really visualize things in code, or we can kind of a lot of us have the 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 skills to sit down and really think about, or maybe we sketch it on a whiteboard and and we sort of see the idea manifesting in our head, and we're ready to start writing code. But what we don't always have confidence in is are we delivering what we need to deliver the desired outcomes? So we can, we can dive into that a, a little bit further. And then once we kind of know that we're all in sync, we've broken down those assumptions, we've, we've fully understood what we need, then we start to really define the API. And what we do there is we look for the operations, the events, all of the elements of the API without making a decision about the API style we're going to use, whether it's going to be REST, REST or GraphQL or gRPC or, or something else. Uh, we don't want to uh, 
make that decision too early. We want to think about the design independent of that. Once we have that, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just about to ask, would you would it, would it be fair? Like, so I like to like like to say that an API is a language. It's it's a language. You know how somebody can communicate with somebody else about like getting something done. Would you agree that at this level, it's about agreeing what the language kind of covers, what it allows you to do without nailing down the exact syntax of it, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, in the align phase. Uh, we, we focus in on a couple of techniques that help us to make sure that our vocabulary is unified. Uh, in the domain-driven world, they call that ubiquitous language, the language that's used within a particular bounded area. It has a specific meaning, and the meanings of those words may change as you go between contexts or between boundaries. But within that boundary, we should be using the same terminology and not picturing two different definitions or ideas of it. We should be completely unified. And that's what the align phase is about. And that helps us to define the vocabulary. And then as we get into the defined, we're manifesting that vocabulary into how we're going to interact with the API. So what are the operations? What things can we do? At a high level, what are the inputs and outputs? I mean, we, we do have to get to that level so that we can really think about an API and, and discuss it you know, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, what our resources might be, you know, what those things are, what, how are we defining them or what do we mean by them and so on. So at that level, yes, it helps us to all understand. So it's, it's very collaborative and it's meant to make sure that product owners, tech leads, eventually the developers that, you know, if you have different developers than those that are involved in the process to, to actually code it up, do all the, the hard integration, hard work, build the automated tests and so on, all of those things making sure everyone's all in alignment and we're using the same language and we're defining the API in, in a clear and consistent way. And it gives us a chance to do that, absolutely. Okay, so I think then after the define stage, phase, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, everybody is kind of in agreement that we're building the right thing and yep. what it roughly should do, so to speak, or what it should do, let's put it like this. Yeah. And then we're jumping to the next phase, I would assume, of design, which then becomes a more technical exercise, I would assume. It does. So in the first align and, and most of the define phase, your product owners or product managers tend to be driving a lot of the conversation. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are bringing the, uh, you know, the elements to the table that says this is what we need. Uh, the business values these aspects, our customers or partners value these things, or these are the, the things that they're trying to do, the outcomes they're trying to achieve and trying to automate. And then as we move through the define phase and into design, now we have more of a technical ownership. Now, that doesn't mean that our product owners that are very technically you know, minded can't drive it or be heavily involved with it. But it tends to kind of switch over a little bit to more of that technical aspect. So we have to start making decisions about what is the right API style? And so, you know, weighing out what's the right fit? Who's going to use it? What devices are using it? Is this going to be browser based? Is this system to system, organization to organization where, you know, we don't we're not constrained by limitations of the browser? Those will inform our decision about which API style or styles we're using. And, and notice that I said styles plural. Uh, I think in our last discussion too, we mentioned that it's not a versus, which is the best, REST versus GraphQL. It's about which is the right thing for the need. And it might mean both. Might mean that we deliver a REST API with some web hooks for, for callbacks, you know, for asynchronous style interactions. And then maybe a GraphQL query for more ad hoc response shaping capabilities, all those different things we need. So we need to think about that. And, 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 you know, weigh that out. That is a really interesting point. And I wanted to interrupt you here just because yeah. I'm curious. So are there any real world examples where you did do that, where you started, you know, the A and D phase, and then in the design phase, you built more than one API for the same, so to speak, definition? Yeah, so I, I can't speak too much to it because unfortunately I've got an NDA that's in between the, and it was a behind the scenes <laughs> API, it's like a partner okay. API, so I can't speak okay. to a website for it. But yes, um, we have often 
during the define phase identified events and said, wow, you know, this would be really powerful, not just to emit the events in our own internal message broker or Kafka stream or, you know, what, whatever they were using. I think they were using a combination, but rather say, what if we expose these events as webhooks and went ahead and allow them to react to things that are happening inside our own system and not have to constantly pull by calling the same get method and trying to diff the, the responses and, and do all kinds of fancy <laughs> anything changed, words. To anything changed, anything changed. Exactly. <laughs> and then if you see something different, come back in the response, can you detect the change? Is there sufficient representation in the resource to, to determine that there's a change? Or is it just something else is different, but we can't really figure that out. Uh -huh. And then we have to make multiple more calls, you know, to go get the representations and try. Uh, it's just a nightmare. So you look at it and you go, wow, OK, here's some really interesting events that if we open these up and they did, they open them up via web hooks. And then uh, I had one other client do something similar and they were using web sockets. Uh, they were more device oriented. And those developers were a lot more comfortable with web sockets and would rather have a, a connection to a server that they had pushed messages to than to stand up an HTTP server and receive a web hook. So, you know, there's mm -hmm. trade-offs there, but it definitely does happen. And now I'm starting to see discussions. Um, well, do we want REST or GraphQL? And people are saying, well, you know, we, we want REST for reasons of tooling support, familiarity, different things there but we'd like to have the response shaping capabilities in graphql and we don't want to have to reinvent those on top of our rest operations so why don't we offer a graphql but only for the queries to support some okay. you know ad hoc response shaping type of interactions but still use rest for the what would be graphql mutations so that there's a consistent way to interact with the resources but it gives us that extra little advantage to be able to have more robust query capabilities and response shaping for when we need those. That's an interesting thing as well, actually. Uh, it, it totally makes sense. But so far, I have not really thought about this, that yes, you could also, instead of building two APIs for the same definition, so to speak, using different styles, you could also kind of cut one API in half and say, for this part of the API, this is better. And for that part of the API, that other pattern or technology works better. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And with REST APIs, we, we do have patterns and things we can apply to include resources and, and you know, in response shake. But we kind of have to invent those ourselves. And we could stay consistent within the scope of our world of APIs that we control, but they might be different than someone else's API. So at least we get the advantage of, of more of a standardized specification with GraphQL to, mm -hmm. to drive that and makes it a lot easier. Okay, so now we have an API design or multiple API designs, maybe even. And now let's move on to the last phase, which is refine. So what happens during refine? Yeah, re refining is really important. What we do there is we, we take the artifacts from design, and most of the time, I recommend the artifacts being for REST, the you know using the Open API specification or or API Blueprint or one of those standard markup languages to have a machine readable representation of your API, and that's about as far as we take it. With Refine, we're going to expand that documentation and start to maybe create static mocks, like README style mocks, to show how you'd use the API. So one of the things I've done is I've participated and helped coach other teams a lot in API design reviews. Some organizations call them DX reviews, you know, developer experience reviews or something. And they'll just show their open API design and they'll come in going, look, look, look what I did. You know, this, this is a great API design. <laughs> and I'll look at it and I go, yeah, I agree. But how am I supposed to use it? You've just shown me 12 operations and I'm not sure how I'm supposed to use them to get things done. I can look at each operation independently and tell you what I think about it or in groups, but I really don't know if it delivers the desired outcomes that you're looking for. So I need a little bit more than what reference documentation from, from the open API spec or a schema definition language from GraphQL or, or IDL from gRPC is gonna tell me. So let's use like a little readme style. Show me step-by-step step using a little bit of markdown, a little bit of code either in a programming language or with just HTTP request response pairs and so on. Show me how this API 
delivers outcomes. And we can reach back into the align phase and use this technique called job stories that we had in the align phase, which help us to, to think about when a problem occurs, I want to perform a job so that I can achieve this outcome. And I can go back and grab that outcome and actually show how the API delivers that outcome. So this, this whole ADDR process comes full circle because the work we did in the beginning to align also includes aligning on what the desired jobs are and the outcomes are. And we can bring that back in and show someone with a static mock of how they would use the API or maybe a getting started guide and, or, or the static mock becomes a getting started guide. I write a little request response pairs. I show the sequence of examples. Everybody gives me feedback during that, uh, that refine phase. I improve my design. I make tweaks while it's still less expensive to make that change before all my codes in production, uh -huh. you know, and it's too late. And I can then uh, quickly incorporate that feedback and then use that static mock to help drive my getting started guides, cookbooks, or other kinds of assets that I might need to help that first, second, fifth developer get started using my API. So the refine phase is all about improving the design, gaining more feedback, and then working through the process again. And ADDR is meant to be iterative. So we, we can align and define on a, on a scope and then design, refine smaller units of work. So we get to incorporate our agile principles. This isn't a big kind of waterfall process, but we get to have it in a repeatable way and to incorporate the feedback of those that will likely be using our APIs, internal teams, external teams, whoever that might be and refine the design before we write all of the code, uh, you know, and finalize it, polish it, put it in yeah. production. That is that, I like the part where you specifically said, you know, it's kind of like an API design review, but it's important to really make sure that it's not just looking at the static design, so to speak, mm -hmm. but to really have this dynamic aspect of saying, show me how this solves the problem that I want to have solved. Right. That yeah. we're like, okay, walk me through those steps and explain it to me or allow me to try it out in some simple way. And then I can much better give you feedback whether it, it is what it should be or whether it should be refined, I guess. Yeah, I think Frank Lloyd so, Wright, Wright has a very popular quote that I think we use in API space sometimes, which is it's it's easier to use an eraser on the drawing board than it is a sledgehammer on the construction site. <laughs> <laughs> right? I haven't heard that in a while, I have to admit, but yes, yeah. I do remember seeing it. So that's, sure. that's really, I mean, if you were to distill down ADDR, that's really what it's about. It's about mm -hmm. encouraging communication with the teams, getting the right roles working together so that we're not as developers putting on our headphones, cranking the music and writing a bunch of code with every line building in an assumption that may or may not be right. And we won't know until it's too late or too expensive to change and really spending time to kind of use that eraser initially. And then we can really sprint hard to get this thing delivered mm -hmm. with confidence that every line of code that we're writing is actually going to arrive in production because we know where we're headed. That's really what it's about. And I think it's 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 very timely, I think, for those things to appear and, and your method I think we can disclose that is not the only one that has been proposed. But I think it, we, we can tell that there is a demand for this, right? People more and more want to design good API products, not just good APIs, but like good API products that work as products. And, and I think anything that helps you in that direction is, is very important. And I think it, it, it's, it's, it's good to try to not use your sledgehammer too much. And Absolutely. for those who want to learn more, I think we can point them to your book, The Principles mm -hmm. of Web API Design, right? That should have, that has, it shouldn't have, it has more information on ADDR, so people can check that out. And with that, any closing words from you, James? Yeah, I just, I would encourage those that, that have uh, sat down and listened to and learned a little bit about the ADDR process to, to pick up the book or... Um, you know, try to, if you're, if the ADR process doesn't feel like it's a great fit for your organization, and I'll admit it's not always, that's why there's multiple ones, as you mentioned, but, but be sure to try to find a process that's scalable and repeatable because a lot of organizations have a lot of teams building a lot of APIs really fast. So to be able to get people up to speed uh, is, is really important. So find that repeatable process. That's, that's what it's about. 
Uh, in the meantime, I'd also uh, suggest if you're just interested in APIs, jump onto the newsletter. You can go to apideveloperweekly.com and there's a little form you can sign up for. I send out a newsletter once a week. I hand curate articles and I've been doing it for years. It's really viable for those that are in the API space. You can see you know, things about what businesses are using APIs, tips and tricks and such for practitioners, for you know, those that are uh, executive level overseeing an API program, whatever it is. So just encourage you to check that out, apideveloperweekly.com. Yeah, I'll put it down here somewhere when I'm editing. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I definitely recommend. Yeah, I, I recommend that one. It's really useful. It it is. It 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 has an excellent signal to noise ratio. So it's. I think it is something that every API enthusiast should consider subscribing to. James, thanks so much for taking the time. I think there was another really good conversation around web API design. This time a little more focused on the process. Thanks for taking the time. And um, well, until next time, I hope to have you back soon, maybe. Let's see. Sounds great. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate it. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to the channel. And with that, uh, we're done for today. Bye, everybody. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.